so this is going to be, I think, a, a really special and uh, uh, sort of exchange of ideas about artificial intelligence and its uh, potential for healthcare. So we have for you, um, uh, of course, uh, Professor Forgo, who, uh, who is going to be the moderator and maybe will share some of his ideas as well. Uh, Kurt Long, the CEO of Fair Warning, <coughs> is here to talk, about, um, to talk about his perspective on this, having seen <laughs> how a lot of major health and I think also financial businesses are using AI. And um, we have John Havens, who's the executive director of the IEEE Global Initiative. And this is, this is a voluntary organization with people participating in trying to develop standards to put ethics into artificial intelligence. And people from around the world can join this project, right? So you should, you should talk about that too, John. And um, so, um, Nicholas, I'll, I'll get out of your way. And thank you. Thank you all for being here. Okay, thank you again, Deborah. Good morning, everybody. Also from my side, I'm very excited to uh, chair this panel now because in a, um, one of the feelings that I have after... Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so one of the feelings that I have after a day of attending here is that when we speak about uh, privacy and medical research and medical treatment, we have a kind of two speeds phenomenon here. On the one hand, we have presentations about artificial intelligence and all the possibilities that might come out of this, which is in a way a very futuristic perspective. And on the other hand, we have uh, presentations dealing with issues that are around for more than 20 years now, meaning that everything is still on paper, that every record is enshrined somewhere in the hospital, that there is no uh, interchange possible that there are all kinds of um, <coughs> issues when it comes to allow patients to get access to their data, uh, etc. And 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 one of the challenging things of this panel possibly might be to 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 think about in how far these two speeds or these two phenomenons might be better connected with each other, helping patients at the very end, not only to receive the information, but also to receive better treatment. And I'm very, very interested in hearing um, on this. Um, let me just emphasize at the beginning, and perhaps we will have the time to come back to this, that again, Europe has probably a rather uh, different approach to, to the ethical considerations that might be uh, relevant here, in particular when it comes to um, machines and, um, and artificial intelligence systems making decisions autonomously uh, without asking a human. Uh, the, the European regulatory framework is very, very restrictive on this, but that would be perhaps a second aspect to talk about. I don't know who of you would like to start. Is there any preference? I'll be glad to, to go. And okay. uh, I hope I don't uh, spend everything I have to say in the opening remarks. I'm really anxious to hear what uh, John has to say. One of the reasons that we participated in the event this year is because of this topic, artificial intelligence and the ethical considerations. And then closely related is um, uh, security monitoring and ethical considerations. So both, both of these topics somehow uh, directly resonate. Um, and before, before getting too far in, I want to state something that I think is obvious. But in order to have ubiquitous, affordable, and even predictive uh, health care, uh, machine learning and technology uh, is, is essential. And there's at least hundreds of millions. It depends on what uh, report that you read, whether it's uh, 400 million or, or 2 billion persons, some, um, some, something in between of people on the planet don't have access to, to health care or, or sanitized facilities. And whether it's to lower the costs or whether it is to literally make health care ubiquitous so all of humanity can participate in opportunity, uh, machine learning is, is somehow essential to this. And you have things like the X Prize that Peter Diamondis runs. Uh, John, you, you may well know more about this than me. But, uh, you know, the, the vision here is that on a handheld device, um, th this handheld artificially intelligence device can match 
uh, the diagnoses of, of uh, several board certified physicians. And this is a very interesting prospect, right? So in any case, with, with that said, there's some real considerations that we have to have. Um, the first that I'll say is I think that it, there needs to be a level of transparency uh, affiliated uh, with machine learning systems, and that's both in terms of consent and intended use of the data that they use. Uh, the second, uh, uh, with regard to transparency, I think it's going to be um, uh, algorithmically or at least approach-driven what the approaches are in this machine learning system. And I'm going to pivot back to why I think that's important in just a moment. But I think transparency is a core tenant. Um, I think that values alignment, I think that uh, when we look at machine learning, the scale uh, at which we can deploy this technology is immense, um, meaning it can be as, as uh, Mr. Fleming, uh, Dr. Fleming pointed out, you can get it onto an iPhone so that as we think about machine learning being pushed out, the scale of it is so significant and its ability to learn quickly and modify behavior is at, at, at a size that's unprecedented. There has to be a values alignment between the recipient and participant in the technology and the vendor and the holder of the technology or we're going to see uh, behaviors that, uh, that we, 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 we wouldn't expect. And then the last thing I would say is that I'm personally a believer in supervised uh, learning systems. I think that there should be a human in the loop and that we cannot just ultimately this this it's not just in healthcare uh, this notion that we're going to create machines that are are far greater than we are in in their intelligence is is um, today it's it's narrow case intelligence you know tomorrow we're saying it's going to be broad broad intelligence we I personal opinion is we cannot surrender to the machine in terms of it knows more than us and we become just this recipient of information that comes out of it and, and act on it without question. I think that's an extremely dangerous posture um, and it has far reaching implications even to in something as simple as a first step, what does it mean in a legal system uh, to present evidence uh, to a judge uh, with because the computer said without being having transparency around the associated evidence and around the algorithmic approaches that led us to conclude that this person had done something maybe that's at an extreme but that's where the this conversation can go down one thread and those are those are some of my opening thoughts and I'm really looking forward to hearing others mm -hmm. Uh, it may be a boring panel because I deeply align with everything you just said. <laughs> That's so I guess we're done. <laughs> no, um, and the good thing too is ethics, very simple, data, uh, of course I'm kidding. Uh, my name is John Havens and I'm representing, uh, how many people know IEEE in the audience just for interest? Oh, awesome. I thought you would. I was hoping you would. So for the those folks who don't, uh, IEEE, uh, which is IEEE.org, is the world's largest uh, technology association. It's about a half million members in 160 countries around the world, so it's very large. And those are members, uh, it, it influences a lot more people, millions and millions of engineers. Um, and what I'm so excited about being here today, and I want to say a special thank you to Deb Peel and Adrian. Uh, I'm honored to be here. They're also involved in a personal data committee that we run. Uh, uh, Doc Searles, I'm a huge hero of Doc and Joyce, who are here today. Um, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing and then also respond to some of the stuff you said, Kurt, which I just thought was excellent. <coughs> so IEEE is very, very large. Um, uh, internally at IEEE there are different operating units and I only bring this up to say that uh, there's something called the Standards Association which is one of the operating units of about seven. In the Standards Association obviously a big thing they do is actually formally create what are called SDOs uh, or, or, or standards that are used around the world or it is a, a standard development organization. So why standards are so important, this is stuff I didn't know till about a couple of years ago, frankly, uh, um, is you, you're probably familiar with the Wi-Fi standard. The reason you're able to go on Wi-Fi right now is because of a naturally standard. And I bring that up because it seems very relevant in terms of technical uh, interoperability uh, never really comes in isolation, right? Meaning Wi-Fi was created initially by about 200 turned to people in a working group. And by the way, the working groups I'll talk about that I'm involved with, they're all free. You don't have to be an IEEE member. Uh, 
and I come from a background of like pod camps and bar camps and creating wikis and, and very much loving the idea that anybody should be allowed to participate in groups that are deeply going to influence things like data and technical interoperability. So that's one of the reasons I love IEEE. It's probably also because I don't have the money to necessarily spend to be involved in other groups. So the dem dem democratic aspect of building standards is something I really love. But when you think about technical, uh, technological interoperability, something like Wi-Fi, now it sort of seems you know, obvious. Everyone should use Wi-Fi. But at the time, uh, based on where you were around the world, what technology we're going to use was deeply embedded in things like policy. Some people had put a lot of money into RFID investment. Also things like business investment, meaning, again, someone had spent a lot of money on RFID. It's like back in the days of VHS and Betamax, right? You bought like, you know, eight movies on Betamax, like Ernest Goes to Camp or whatever, and then you're like, crap, now it's VHS, and then VHS went away. Anyway, um, so the, the, the project that I am executive director for it's a long name. It's called the IEEE Global Initiative for Ethical Considerations in Artificial Intelligence and Autonomous Systems. And we're doing two main things. One is creating a paper called Ethically Aligned Design. And the other thing is we make recommendations to the IEEE Standards Association based on our work. And uh, the real, and this is now getting to some of the stuff Kurt is talking about, um, there are so many issues, and I'm happy to talk about a lot of them here. Uh, what we did with our paper is we separated them into verticals. So, for instance, we have a committee on personal data that um, Adrian and Deb are part of. <coughs> and in each of the different verticals, we have law. We have one focused on embedding values into systems. The big question is, in light of artificial intelligence and ethical issues, how do we move forward thinking about these things? And so what Kurt talked about, things like transparency, is a huge deal in terms of artificial intelligence. Uh, put very simply, why is that thing doing that thing, <laughs> right? For a person to be able to say, I'm using a product. And then also in terms of Europe, we touched on this a little bit. Uh, we just did an event in the parliament a few months ago where a wonderful woman named Maddie DeVoe, who is the rapporteur on a big report that I think you were referring to called um, Civil Law Rules on Robotics, talked about the idea of robotic personhood. And in the States, pretty much in the last two years. <laughs> Anytime you see the, the initials AI, and I'm a, I'm a journalist in my, in my past life and I still do some of it. I write for Mashable and The Guardian. You can't always control what pictures get placed, but if the initials AI are in an article, typically it's like, get either a Schwarzenegger picture, get me Schwarzenegger. I want the Terminator picture up there, or now I want uh, you know Outlander, or Black Mirror, put Black Mirror. So you start an article about artificial intelligence, freaked out and scared, right? That's not the best way to start an article. But the reason it's such an important topic that we're trying to cover is to say, let's move beyond the fear. There is reason to be, if not fearful, concerned, but uh, I got involved in this project because I thought we can't just have either utopian visions, AI is going to save the world, or dystopian visions, AI is going to destroy the world. There has to be a middle ground. And the middle ground, most of what we're focused on is saying cross-pollination. And uh, I can get more specific about what we're doing, um, uh, but I, well, I'll say this. We've already, now we have uh, seven, I'm sorry, eight approved standards working groups uh, three or four of them are focused on data. One, which I was so excited to hear from uh, uh, John, uh, the doctor, just now, talk about this idea. It's called P7006. Love to have you get involved if you want. It's basically about building what he was describing, not necessarily focused on the patient, but the patient can use it. This idea of a portal for every individual to have a place where they can have a repository for all of their data, certainly their medical data, but all of their data, where it wouldn't be controlled by the algorithm, to your point, the human in the loop is essential, essential. But it would be something where an algorithm could also help you control data about yourself. It's very complex. It's not easy. Anything you build can be hacked. Oftentimes I'll talk and people will be like, you know, that can be hacked. And I'm like, I know, anything can be hacked. That doesn't mean you don't build it. Uh, anyway, so I can talk more about these standards projects. Would love to get you involved because I've, I'm a big believer. And if you get a lot of people like yourselves in this room, um, and work towards consensus. It doesn't mean everyone agrees. This is another reason I love working with IEEE. Everyone agreeing is probably not going to happen. But when you can come to consensus, which is like an 80% idea of like, we have to do something. Do we all think this is the right direction to go in consensus? Then you move forward and can create policy and help people where you cross pollinate. And that's the last big thing I'll say in this opening part is the cross pollination. Anything I do, I'm very aware of what I don't know.
but what I'm good at is recognizing other people who do know more than I do. For instance, the two of you. <laughs> and so if I can put people on a committee and say, my skill set is in bringing together smart people who don't agree, then the cross-pollination means we get the medical experts. And by the way, I should say, I think I've said in closing like seven times, so forgive me, that's a bad speaking technique because some people are like, and he said he was going to stop. But my dad was a psychiatrist, and I'm missing him a lot today. He passed away in 2011. And I think of every Saturday morning, he spent the first part of every morning doing Blue Cross records, so I didn't get to see him. It's probably why I suck at throwing a baseball. So a lot of the technology can help um, save time, but it has to be done, and this includes artificial intelligence, it has to be done in a way where consent, transparency, accountability are, are primary in how it is uh, uh, proliferated and designed. Was that 45 minutes? Are we done? Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so um, let me, John, if I may, ask, start with a very easy question. I mean, I think probably all of us agree that transparency and accountability, et cetera, are important. The question now is how to achieve these goals. Would you think that this is something which is to be organized within a standardization body internally, like the one that you speak for here, here, IEEE, or is this something where a government or a lawmaker is expected to make a first step in order to set the regulatory framework within which a standardization body like your one, yours, can, can, can then act with? So what, who should be first? It's a great question. I will be shorter in these responses than my opening one. And secondly, I should say I'm speaking today as John, so the stuff that I'm saying is not official IEEE policy, as it were. Um, but I think what we're finding in experience is, is uh, uh, I, I guess what I'm going to say in the answer of which should it be, Right now, in my research over the past four years, I wrote a book that came out last year called Artificial Intelligence, because I'm sadly addicted to puns. When I kept interviewing people, I said, the unintended consequences of AI. You know, I would ask people about this idea of a black box technology. I said, I think I would talk to CEOs creating things like large scale, not AI, autonomous systems, to your point, Kurt, things that are not necessarily not even close to anything like artificial general intelligence. This is machine learning, which for instance is drastically changing the call center industry. The call center industry is one that has been very, very drastically changed by jobs being replaced by AI. So I would ask CEOs, I'm like, I think the reason people are freaked out besides they're losing jobs is they don't get what it is that you do. So your algorithms, I'm assuming they're transparent and accountable. Um, there's also a term called traceability, where basically you can walk back and say, what did the algorithm do? And a lot of times, uh, the answer would come back, you know, we're not really sure. Sometimes you build an algorithm, and mathematically something happens, and you can't explain why. And I said, well, that's going to freak people out. And then I said, so then what, what, what are we thinking is going to happen in terms of regulation? Was getting back to your question. And a lot of people kept saying, well... It's not really until something bad happens that, you know, the regulation will then kind of come in and start to set things straight. And I was like, what is a bad thing? Is that an autonomous vehicle, you know, killing the driver or the rider rather? And, and I thought to myself, that doesn't seem the best way to go. Um, that said, um, standards uh, based on where you live around the world uh, are what are typically known as soft governance. It's not law. Right, uh, meaning it's something that an IEEE standard, there's a lot of other ISO great standards bodies. When there's not law created, then these soft governance uh, tools are used to give people guidance, but they are not enforced by law. So what should happen, um, I guess to, to answer the question is, I don't personally want to see a world where we wait to find out what will be the first, uh, and I hate to even use this analogy, but what's the Hiroshima of artificial intelligence gone awry. And AI is such a broad term that it's like saying the internet. But to the average citizen, they won't know that it's machine learning versus cognitive computing. There'll just be a lot of media that says, AI has done X bad thing. Then that means that understandable policymakers and legislators will say, well, now we don't have time to debate ethics, <laughs> right? We have to go in and change policy and law because people are losing their lives. So. The work we're doing now is to try to say, let's get these different tools and, and guidelines and principles and standards in place to support the lawmakers so that we can envision what could be, quote, a tragedy and avoid it ahead of time. But then also things like the GDPR, which I'm a huge fan of, 
And I know um, uh, Paul Nemitz, I consider him a personal hero, the architect of the GDPR. And I also think, look, in terms of data situations, the GDPR to me is one of the last vestiges of the opportunity for the human race, frankly, to say, hold on, the GDPR is not perfect. It is not simple, but it is legislation that has teeth. And by May 2018, a lot of people will be trying to deal with their data situations that wouldn't have before. It's an opportunity for clarity and conversation. Mm. Well, perhaps, I mean, if I may, I can, I can show you briefly one of the, uh, one of the articles uh, of the GDPR. I have it here dealing explicitly with the issue. So this is, uh, it's article uh, 22, if that is of any interest. Uh, so that's what it says. Um, um, automated individual decision making, including profiling. Um, so the rule is the data subject shall have the right not to be a subject to a decision based solely on automated processing, including profiling which produces legal effects concerning him or her or similarly significantly affects him or her. So there is no automated decision making, that's the rule. And then there is an exception, um, again, either explicit informed consent of the subject, which is something I spoke about quite extensively yesterday, <laughs> or second possibility, um, uh, automated decision making might be legal if the processing is necessary for reasons of substantial public interest on the basis of law, blah, 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 um, and provided that there are suitable and specific measures to safeguard the fundamental rights and the interests of the data subject. Okay, so this is, this is the European situation as it stands at the GDPR. And when I look um, then into phenomenons like the one that you already mentioned, which is um, autonomous driving, um, and I look into phenomenons like this one here. This is a very nice example I, I always used. It's, um, it's a website from the MIT called uh, Moral Machine. Um, and what you can do there is simply click around and play around uh, when you see typical moral philosophical dilemmas coming from autonomous cars. So the car you see, the blue thing you see here, as a non-working brake, and then the, the autonomous system needs to make tough decisions what to make. Either no changes are made, then the people on the left side of the picture die, and if it decides to move, um, the system decides to move, then other people die. This, and you can play 25 or 30 different uh, of those scenarios on that website. And my question to both of you now probably would be, First, do you think that an approach like this one here is useful? So does that make any sense at the moment? And the second one is, how would you then, provided that this is or not useful, how would you deal with situations like this one here then from a regulatory point of view? I mean, it's quite easy to say that that machine should be transparent, but, but what is the value behind the decision that needs to be transparently taken here? And <clears throat> The scenario being that we've lost no brakes in the car, and the car has to dis make a decision yes, autonomously indeed, so about where, indeed, it, where right. to steer. So the, the brakes don't work, and either the people on the left side die or the people on the right side die, and there are different conditions: whether they were, uh, who they are, how old they are, whether they, uh, whether the lights are green or red, etc. So different moral or, or information that might be of moral interest or impact yeah. here. So. I'm going to see if I can take this one. I don't know if this is a fair answer, but I'm going to do this thing. So talk, when we talk about the alignment of values, mm -hmm. um, I think that this is a really, this is a hard problem to, to work on. And when I say hard problem, I mean a lot of time and energy needs to go into it. Mm -hmm. Alignment of value in this case means that the car values human life above itself, quite frankly. Yeah and that those people on the sidewalk are irreplaceable, the car is replaceable, and the value that is instilled into the software that runs that car is that it will drive itself into the wall on the left. Mm -hmm. Because there's no people in the path, it may destroy itself, it may bring injury to those in the car, but all of the people on the sidewalks' lives are preserved. Mm -hmm. 
Well, so, I mean, that is an easy dilemma, but there are people, <laughs> are, I mean, they're kind of think about... Well, well, uh, I mean, you might not I mean, like the answer, but no, I, I think the car should drive into the wall. It, can, I, can I respond to that? Yeah. Okay. Which is, um, no, it's a really hard challenge because in isolation, this is known as the tunnel problem uh, based on the trolley problem, a famous ethics uh, 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 conundrum. Um, a lot of car manufacturers have said, though, by the way, I'm not disagreeing with what you just said, but a lot of car manufacturers are saying we can't come up with every condition that humans around a vehicle could come into, meaning there may be things like what if people start to attack autonomous cars because they're freaked out by them, right? And they endanger, you know, whatever, that, that's sort of a Luddite example. But um, So a lot of car manufacturers, right or wrong, are saying what we can do is make sure that we can ensure the safety of the rider. That's what we actually can control. So that's what m complicates this is, um, you know, the autonomous car creators, and you can think they're right or wrong. I'm just saying that's a, a sort of a trend has become them to say, we don't have the capacity. In the same way people build cars now, right? You can't build brakes that necessarily will deal with every last thing. Um, but that's what also complicates the issue. I, I, I'm going to be fourth rate. I don't see it as, I'm, I, my perspective is, I think humanity comes above machines. I said that in the opening remarks to say we can't surrender to the machine and uh, I, I'm not, the robotics personal rights thing doesn't resonate with me yet and I think human beings have personal rights and I think the values from car manufacturers and algorithmically could be published to say human life preserved above machine and in situations where human life will be lost or injured, there's this hierarchy, minimize human loss, minimize injury, save, save from injury, right? I mean, those are kind of value systems and frameworks that I think, I think they could be, I think it could be worked. Can I, can yeah, I, yeah. no, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I don't want to confuse in this, this ethical situation, not taken out of context, but it's also something when you're saying humans will die either way, mm. right? Like the thing about uh, the, the one sort of yes and to what you're saying is slamming into a wall doesn't usually just sort of minimally hurt the rider. It usually could, could kill riders. But, mm. um, so w one thing just to t take a step back, getting back to the legislation thing, is I want to give what I think is a good example and a negative uh, example of this type of autonomous vehicle situation um, is when, and not to pick on Tesla, if anyone's watching from Tesla, you make awesome cars. Um, but about a year and a half ago, and from a PR standpoint, I used to be an EVP of a top 10 PR firm, um, there was a decision made that the autonomous vehicle that people had, the Tesla vehicles, from day A to day B, there would be a firmware upgrade where the car would have the, auto the ability to drive autonomously. So what you can still see online is, the ve is, is a lot of videos, and I'm a geek, so I understand these kids, younger people, sitting in the back seat of their Teslas going, dude, I enabled my firmware upgrade. I'm not driving. And I watched it for about four seconds as a geek. Like, that is awesome. And then I saw cars on the other side of that vehicle on a highway near San Francisco. And I'm a dad. And then I got livid. Because I said, anything about this whole situation that happened that enabled people, geeks like myself, to let their cars drive on the roads without the safety and the NHSTSA, this is something, this was an example of a tragedy waiting to happen. And as a PR person, I would have said to Tesla, are you kidding me? And the PR message to people was, hey, when this firmware upgrade happens, please make sure to keep your hands on the wheel, right? They did the right stuff. So I don't want to pick on Tesla too much. They did the right stuff. But as humans, we aren't designed to listen to lessons. It was bad design, which is shocking to hear about from Tesla. Cut to about a year later, when Uber self-driving taxis came out, and I thought, here we go again. We're gonna risk human lives. Here's what they did right. They first of all hired professional drivers to sit with their hands over the wheel, so you could not take a cab where a driver was not trained. Then they had a technician in the front right passenger seat. So if anything happened to the vehicle, they would pull gently over to the side and say, folks, you know, we're, we're dealing with something. We want to focus on your safety. That was the right way to do it, mm. right? Two examples of a lot of this stuff that comes out in isolation is like, well, realistically, sometimes technology just comes into the public sphere because there aren't laws yet. 
There are good ways to do it and bad. And a lot of the focus of our, our work is also to say, you cannot, as it were, blame a human. Because by the way, right now today, you're a good driver. You're not drunk. You're a, dr a professional NASCAR driver. And you have your hands on the wheel. There's tons of data showing. If your wife says, oh my gosh, and you turn because you're worried about her health, the four to five seconds of where you turn, I think it's like a four second window where accidents can happen, right? So the fact that humans are designed a certain way, and by the way, I'm agreeing with you about prioritizing humans where we are today, we have to understand both from a legal standpoint and a design standpoint, it is not enough to simply say to someone, you should do X, when as a human, we may be allowed to do Y and jump in the back seat in that example. So all I'm, all I'm saying is there's a lot of stuff that can be the groundwork like I just explained to this example, where this example it gets a little bit easier to kind of unpack. Mm -hmm. uh, if you'd allow me to uh, build on this question, but in a very different way. And, and actually, we have an opportunity here because the three of you represent three different perspectives on intellectual property as medicine. Uh, we, we have somebody that works with industry uh, and is concerned from that perspective. We have somebody who is industry, mm -hmm. and we have an ethicist, if I could take that mm -hmm. liberty to put you in that position. Uh, around, I, and I'm not saying you are, I'm just mm -hmm. sort of. And, and the question came up earlier today, uh, and my question to all three of you is, at what point do we draw the line in privatizing medicine, in using artificial intelligence, using the fact that these are machines, and whether they're machines that are doing, driving a car or machines that are providing decision support, in other words, whether they're replacing the pilot or they're replacing the physician, uh, we have, uh, at least in healthcare, maybe not in airline, uh, safety, we have a tradition for no part of medicine is secret, zero. Uh, it may be intellectual property that is not secret, uh, you know, copyrights, uh, journals, or patents. And now, as we apply uh, artificial intelligence to medicine, we are faced with this issue. Uh, in some cases, the, there is no incentive, in many cases, for the manufacturer of that artificial intelligence to make it transparent because now they've moved away from patents and copyright into a trade secret domain. And how much of medicine should we allow to move out of patent and copyright as intellectual property into trade secret? Please. Mm -hmm. Either here. Uh, so I'm going to back my way into it just a bit uh, because you uh, correctly identified me as a person uh, who, who manufactures and sells software and entrepreneur. So first I'm going to offer an entrepreneurial perspective um, and that perspective and, and this represents a market with an enormous market size, right? It's going to, and, and so if I were a venture capitalist, a private equity, uh, I would identify this as disruptive. I would have been, you know, m m the market size, a uh, hundred billion, perhaps a trillion dollars. So this is very exciting. Um, and if someone, someone on the planet is going to do it, and if, if it's not us, then it's these other, other people, and we are going to miss an economic uh, opportunity um, that could reshape uh, the economics, arguably, little argument in here, it could reshape the economics of the world. In other words, if another country, we, we enjoy the luxury of, uh, of having um, uh, the technology companies are, are, are here in, in, in the United States, but very quickly that can pivot to say China now controls this market and we are consuming China's products and we've lost control of economic markets. And that's not really where I, I want to be. Um, so that's the argument for laissez-faire, for, for buyer beware, this market needs to develop and we need to have risk taking. On the other hand, I'm not the, I'm, I'm a privacy entrepreneur. I'm in the opposite business of, of, of Google and Facebook. 
and I have a different perspective, and that is this te technology is so powerful that I think there needs to be relatively immediate basic governmental frameworks. They can't be incredibly binding because we do want to create market opportunity, but I think there needs to be regulatory framework in place early rather than later. Um, and you'd probably push for patent transparency and otherwise, uh, but it would be thin frameworks to enable economic development. We, but, but, but to get there, we have to agree that this technology has benefit to mankind, which I, which I think it does. So that's, that's how I'd yeah, navigate that. Yeah, just to add to that, I think, um, first of all, I should say that not to be all whatever, but IEEE represents not just industry, but NGOs, policy. It's, it's built to be a cross-pollinator, sort of a UN of, of tech, as it were. Um, FYI. By the way, my stomach is growling. I feel like the mic is picking that up. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> Being tra uh, focused on transparency <laughs> and human. I'm human and transparent. Um, I think one thing about the GDPR, and I'm glad, um, thank you for bringing that up and highlighting stuff in red. I will always, especially right now today, say not just human in the loop, but prioritizing humans right now because there's a fleeting amount of time to do that. And that might sound, that might sound hyperbolic. I don't mean uh, machines will gain sentience, as it were. I just mean that the more that we rely on technology in any part of our life, the more that we don't improve the skills of being human. A lot of that's about emotional intelligence. Uh, in terms of the GDPR, the one thing I think that's really fascinating is how it's going to start to make it obvious to the world that EU citizen data is not a commodity in the same way that American data is. American data, you can access my data, anybody can ex access my data. I'm talking about the advertising realm where I come from when I was still in PR land. Here's the thing I'll say though on that message, and, and I know people may not be in the advertising industry here, back in 2007 and 8 when I still worked in that industry, and our clients were P&G and HP and Gillette. So it was hardcore. I went to the first meeting where Facebook and P&G did their big first deal, right? So in the mouth of the beast, as it were. Um, CPMs, cost per thousands, the advertising internet model is a dying business model. It has been for a decade. If I could say to you, hey, tracking people is going to keep making you money, you know, or if that was something I was fighting against, it would be that much more powerful. And I understand if it makes money, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's broke. It's broke from a business sustainability standpoint. When I can access any of your, I'm not going to talk medical data, that's not my expertise. If I can access any of your data, and by the way, medical data, I'm sure you know the, uh, the formal EHR records I get, but you can also see in social media how much people talk about their health conditions. There's whole businesses built on inferring how people feel. A friend of mine created a company called Sick Weather. It accurately predicts, it can tell when people are going like uh, to Florida for vacation, how many people are already sick because of the words they say, the machine learning sentiment of knowing how many people are sick. So you can change going to Florida because everyone's got a cold, right? All that is to say the business model of commoditizing people's data is a bad, non-sustainable business model unless you're the people that control the pipes, Google, Facebook, Verizon, etc. So that means the GDPR, what that's saying, and from a trade kind of mindset is, European citizens' data is now set apart. And my hope is that will start to make people say, well, wait a second, we're investing all this money for compliance and GDPR anyway, and our business model in the advertising realm has been losing money for, for a decade. Maybe this portal idea that the, the good doctor just talked about, maybe this is a way to allow for a yes end. There's tracking. Tracking's not going away. Right? But along with tracking, people having these portals where they can have a say in how their data is handled, because with the GDPR, these, these basic general sort of leveling, the asymmetry of the playing field is happening anyway, maybe we have a chance to sustain our business. I mean for the next five years. I don't mean 10, 20, 30 years. Like, I just want to be crystal clear about that. From my experience, at least, CPM, the internet economy, is a business model that does not work anymore. I'm going to push you to be clearer because I hear your point. Uh, I was talking about uh, intellectual property. Well, let me uh, add to that. Let no, let me, let me, uh, but, but, no, I'm going to interrupt first. Let me just, is I should say one thing about my data. Because it's a commodity, there's no intellectual property That's associated with my data. I, I, Sorry, I, I meant to say that. Say it yes. So to the extent that uh, Kurt hedged, uh, 
you are saying because all of the inter intellectual property is in it for AI, not for anything else, but for <coughs> AI, is in the personal data, there should be no intellectual property assigned in the terms of secrecy assigned to the vendor. Uh, is well, what I'm saying is the individual, the individual's data, what I get frustrated with on a personal level is because my data is a commodity, First of all, I'm oftentimes not given the, the, the ability to pay for access to my data. Second of all, I understand that if a company says, well, John, all you're doing is tweeting certain whatever, we're adding insights to it, that's value. And I think that's a form of intellectual property. But my unique existence and identity, if it's not captured in the way that there's a formal identity, like the GDPR I think is doing, I think I'm agreeing with you. Meaning an individual's, I guess I'm not. We never really, okay. <laughs> Our data is not you, IP. You, so there's a, there are at least two ways to look at it, intellectual property um, and, and our personal data. I, I thought it was more about intellectual property. But are you looking for commentary on, on the data as well or no? I, I'm simply saying yeah. the question was what part of medicine, medicine being that which one doctor teaches to another, teaches to a machine, and a machine teaches to a doctor, what part of medicine can be turned into a trade secret? Name one aspect of medicine. I'm not talking about bookkeeping. I'm not talking about billing, uh, scheduling. Uh, what aspect of medicine are we willing to turn into secret, uh, into a trade secret? That and was my question. patents don't count as trade secrets in your mind. You're allowed to still patent. I mean, we have a lawyer here. And so then, we have yeah. many lawyers yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. I think you have to err heavily on the side of transparency, meaning, uh, very, very uh, narrow, uh, if any, uh, for completely privatizing uh, how care is rendered. Actually, uh, if I may, I mean, we don't have too much time, but I, I, I want to give a very brief answer because it's a very, 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 very important question in my view. Uh, so my answer would be when it comes to typical systems of intellectual property, it's very clear that the data per se is not protected, neither under patent law nor under, under copyright. So the, the data is free, and that's a very fundamental value, and it's important also, but not only for medicine. What's the tricky part now is, is that when the data becomes part of an AI system and there are all kinds of algorithms working in this AI system, then neither the traditional copyright laws nor the traditional patent laws apply at all directly because nobody, I mean, there might be copyright protection for the computer program for the software and nobody might enforce uh, the owner of that software to get a patent at all, right? So he or she could be very free in deciding, well, I, I protect this by putting it into trade and business secrets rules, which is a very free decision everybody can make. The outcome of this would then be that the data would no longer be accessible to anybody and the AI system would stand per se. That's true. The question now is what to do. Is this something that needs a regulatory approach? So should there be some kind of specific free medical information access act or something? Or is this something which needs to be, uh, I mean, freely developed in a society? Is it an ethical question perhaps where we need ethical bodies dealing with this? If, if I knew the answer, I would not be sitting here probably, right? But, but the question is very, very true. But there's another comment I see here. Um, I, I oh. wanted to follow up on Kurt's point mm -hmm. about global access issues and um, how AI and machine learning might be able to help with those issues specifically. And since we're here at the O'Neill Center that deals with global health issues, and I worked on global health issues, and I spoke to ministers of health from Africa and Central America and, and countries that didn't have enough money to help that billion or two billion people that don't have access to any health care and I talked to ministers of health in Europe who have been running deficits for decades on their health systems, and we're facing a cliff in 2020, a demographic cliff on our health system. How can AI and machine learning help maybe make a equitable prioritization of the limited allocable resources that is healthcare. Yeah, so I'm gonna frame it within a broader context about how I, I think of the problems. 
And that would be, I think all of us have a recognition that the planet has limited resources um, that we're all com competing for uh, and that population growth is uh, t closely correlated to the level, the standard of living, that when we reach a certain standard of living, our strategies about our, our um, children change. And, and we move from, let's have many children in the hopes that one survives, or of some percentage survive, to no, we're gonna have fewer children, and, um, and basically you see populations flatline. And we've seen that you know, over and over again in prosperous industrialized countries. So when we talk about health, um, it's, it is of the penultimate uh, importance that we at least think this through. So we, get, we, we rightly are focused on water supply, vaccines, minimum levels, mosquito nets, in, anything to get out of that subsistence level. Um, and then now I'm, we're Western biased right here with the next comments. In other words, we assume that those who don't have access to Western medicine want it, and that's a big assumption, could be a faulty assumption. But within the context of l l lifting, uh, helping lift to give a basic subsistence level, that now with devices, relatively portable devices, I think companioned by some level of local expertise, we can get real diagnostic capabilities and at least minimum levels of health delivered into rural populations. And I know we think it's like Africa or China or, or India, but that could even be in the United States. It could be in industrialized society. And I think that hope and dream right there, I think that hope and dream is worth pursuing for, for all of the planet, right? So I hope I answered, I hope I answered the question. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, we are more or less on time. Deborah. We are. We're doing pretty well. Um, so thank you for this panel. I very much appreciate it to listen to you. Uh, we have a 15 minutes break. Uh, please be aware of the fact that there is again a breakout session taking place yeah. now. No, and I wanted yeah. to make and one you closing comment. And you need to make a choice whether you stay in this room or go up into room 200. Can I make one closing comment? Oh, sorry. I, I'm, gonna do, I'm running a conference, so Deb can kill me later. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about, uh, but is... Uh, a, a big important thing I'll risk talking about uh, is something called Beyond GDP. Does that title sound familiar to you? Uh, when you talk about AI and values and also medicine, etc., when the primary value of the planet is still gross domestic product, remember that influences how you make what you make. It's not about saying people who try to make money are evil. That's not the point. But we didn't talk about prioritizing things, what we have in the room, about, about human well-being with actual metrics like things like the OECD Better Life Index, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All my point there is to say that a lot of times in the AI conversations I have, we talk about values. But when you still are building everything you build for a, gr a exponential growth, the underlying one number that so many people count on, that will always influence what you build. The GDP was not handed down by God. It was created in the 30s by one guy in the States, and you might think I'm crazy for taking time to do it. That is one of the most important things we have to focus on as society is saying, do we want to continue prioritizing one primary metric that only measures basically income and growth? And Joseph Stiglitz, many of the world's economists say this is an impractical measure, or do we want to prioritize these other more holistic measures of well-being, mental, physical, medical well-being, data uh, accessibility. When that happens, a lot of these questions become very different because the priorities of why you're building and what you're measuring change. We have to, met, we have to change the primary focused lens of what the world uses today, today. Indeed.